sharing communion today. So consequently, there's not going to be some extra things. There's not going to be a special. There's not going to be a children's story today. Although there will be something for the children, and they will definitely catch that if they happen to be in the sanctuary. I do want you to know that. And so I share that with you. This month, this month of March, I want to talk to us about a new relationship in worship. A new relationship in worship. In the book of Genesis, as I've already said, they indeed worship God. Abraham had sacrifices before the Lord. Isaac had sacrifices before the Lord. Jacob had sacrifices before the Lord. You saw that they knew how to worship God. They knew how to get in close with God. And it was an important thing to get in close to God. But as we look at the book of Exodus, a brand new relationship begins in the book of Exodus. A new relationship in worship. And it starts with something called the Passover. Everybody say Passover. Passover. I want you to know I've been to a couple of Passover seeders. I've actually been to two of them, and both of them were very enjoyable. But as I look at the first Passover and realize what I have experienced in a Passover, I realize that they're about this far apart. That they're about this far apart. When I was uh, 16 or 17, I went fishing with a group of boys my age, trout fishing. We camped out, we fished for trout. I had eaten fish before. But up to that point, fish wasn't something that I'm especially fond of. That has changed. I'm going to enjoy the cod. We even get this real cod for the fish fry. It's really good. But up to that point, I was never fond of fish. You can ask my mom how it went. We'd get fish at the store. I would always be the one that got the bone. How many knows that there's nothing worse than getting a bone in your fish? And so when we started going to Canada, I learned how to fillet. <laughs> There was a Native American up there, and uh, he taught me how to do it, and it was just the right thing to do, and you didn't get bones in your fish. But I wasn't real fond of the bones in my fish, and these guys were all talking about how good the trout was and everything like that, and so we had some pretty good luck catching trout. You know, you gotta remember, I come up in Knoxon, we didn't catch all of them with a hook, we caught a lot of them just with our hands. And, uh, and so they were packing them in mud and baking them on the coals of a fire. They didn't take out the insides. They didn't cut the heads off. They didn't skin them. They just packed them in mud, and they cooked them on a fire. Well, they all looked like they were really enjoying them, but I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't take a single bite. It just didn't look like something that was very appealing to me. Now, if you happen to like that, Bless you. You will make a good missionary. <laughs> Speaking about a missionary, we're going to pause for a moment. Rachel is going to be heading out this week to go on her mission trip, and she's hiding, and that's okay. She raised all of her own money this year. I want you to know that. That's why you have her this week. that she has this opportunity and so just right in this. Father God, Father, as Rachel goes on this mission trip, Lord God, we ask God that you would indeed be with her. Lord, that you'd go with her, that you'd let your anointing rest upon her and all of the other crews as well, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that there would indeed be great reports of what the Lord has done and that your touch will have indeed minister unto her and unto all of those that she ministers unto in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you all know Rachel's real shy about getting up in front of everybody. So I asked Rachel if she would put together a video-type presentation so she doesn't have to stand up here, but we can see what she does while she's over there. How many would like her to do that? Yeah. Remember, we don't have to see her, Rachel. You don't have to do a lot. Hey now, back to this. This is called Passover. The reason I told you that story about the fish is because by the time we finish this passage, you're going to realize that the first Passover wasn't like a Passover that you might get invited to. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. I want you to know God was saying, 
This is a brand new beginning. Right here in the Easter season, when they're celebrating Passover, this is supposed to be the beginning of their year. I know they celebrate that in September usually, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says this was to be the beginning of the year. It was to be the beginning of the spring season. It was to be the beginning of plenty. It was to be the beginning of newness. And that's what God wants to impart to us, is that there's a new relationship, and God wants you to understand that there's a new relationship. Just as simple as that. He said, speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons, according to each man's need, and you shall make your count for the lamb. Your sheep lamb will be without a blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. There was a preparation for enough. Everybody say enough. 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 One of the things that I'm happy to learn because I'm trying to lose a little weight is when I've had enough. You know, enough is different than really being satisfied. Enough is different than really being satisfied. You know, and I do know what enough is. I knew when I was in school, you could do this much work and it was enough. You wrote this many paragraphs in English and it was enough. I remember it was those hundred word essays. And you're telling me, 98? Oh, too sharp. I remember those days. You know, you was looking for enough. Enough isn't the same as being satisfied. I remember getting in Bible college and we had an assignment in a writing class. And uh, the guy gave us a very strange assignment. And as we were doing the assignments, we had this kid in our class and, and he wrote this elaborate story and he read it to us in the class. And while he read it, you actually could see the whole thing unfolding, seeing him get caught in the fire wire fence, seeing him get nailed by a bull and thrown over the seats and all of these kind of things. It was fantastic. Our story only had a requirement of a thousand words. His story must have had 10,000 words plus in it. At the end, the professor said to one, we said one question to him. He said, are you satisfied with your work? And the guy smiled and said, yes. There's a difference between enough and satisfied. A lot of us just do enough. Well, on this particular occasion, God knew that this wasn't going to be a great pleasurable thing. And so it wasn't about being satisfied. It was about getting enough. Just enough. Years ago, when we were endeavoring to make some meals for large, pe large groups of people, we realized that you get these things and it tells you about how much portions that everybody needs. And so you can plan a pretty good meal without having a lot of leftovers by realizing most people eat this amount of this and this amount of this and this amount of this and this amount of this. That works pretty good. They had to figure it like that. <coughs> how much of this we could eat so that there was a preparation for enough. Lots of times, we never say, God, what's enough of you? How long has it been since you said, God, how much of you is enough for today? How much of you is enough for today? If I read a scripture verse, is it enough? If I read a chapter, is it enough? If I say a short prayer, is it enough? If I spend 10 minutes in prayer, is it enough? If I leave before the Lord for the day, is it enough? We don't ever ask God what is enough. We've never made the right preparation. And God is letting them know there's a preparation to be made to have enough. To have enough. He tells them to take a lamb or a sheep from the goats. He says, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. They had to keep it in the house. They had to get this lamb, goat, whichever it was, bring it into the house, keep it there. And then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. They were keeping it in their house until that specific time when it was to kill that. That's going to be their sacrificial lamb. That's what they're going to do with it. I'm coming back to that later and you will get that. Then they shall take the blood, some of the blood of it, 
and put it on the two port doorpost and on the lintel of the houses where the heath. I want you to know they had to stick that out where it could be seen. It was an outward sign. It had to be on the doorpost and on the lintels of the house where you entered right in. It had to be an outward sign. There had to be something on the outward that showed what was going to happen on the inside. I want you to catch this carefully. They were to take it and put it on the lintels. On the doorpost, rather. And on the lintel. And of course, if you paint anything like me, if you're painting it up there, it also goes there. Now let me show you this carefully. How many got that? This very first Passover was a sign of the cross of Christ Jesus. Because the blood of that lamb was the blood of a lamb. But it was the blood of the Lamb of God that was coming, whose name was Jesus Christ. Amen. That would be shed for all of us. And when that blood touches you, it's not just enough that there's an inward work that you know is done. There's got to be some kind of an outward sign that the impact of Jesus Christ has made upon your life. It doesn't mean that you have to walk around crossing yourself all the time. It doesn't mean that you have to have ashes put on your head on Good Friday, on Ash Wednesday. It's okay to do that. It's okay to do both of the things. I want you to remember that. But what really is important is that there's been enough change in your life that's seen by those around you. The New Testament says, live in such a way that someone is going to ask you a reason for the hope that you have. Live in such a way that somebody's going to ask you, what's the reason for the hope that you have? And you say, because Jesus Christ has forgiven me of my sins. He's come into my heart and live. The blood was for an outward sign. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire. They were specific things about it. They were to roast it, just like that. It was to be roasted. It wasn't to be boiled. It wasn't to be fried. It was to be roasted, very specifically. And they were to eat it with bitter herbs. When I was the Passover seer, they do pass around some bitter herbs and you take a bite of the bitter herbs. But they have lots of good food too. I want you to remember, this is what they had that night. They had the unleavened bread, which would be like crackers or matzos or things like that. And they had the bitter herbs. And they had this roasted lamb. Now let me tell you this roasted lamb. It says, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. Remember those fish? Nobody took the insides out. Nobody took the heads off. They all seemed to be thinking they were really good. I had a rough time. I couldn't take a bite of I can't imagine having a lamb that's been roasted with the insides in. Rich eats a lot of venison when we get it, right, Rich? You never roast it with the guts in, do you? It doesn't even sound too appealing, does it? No. Some of you have been to pig roast, but you've never roasted them with the insides. What would you think about that if all the insides are in it? Sue's turning up her nose over here. And I want you to realize it wasn't to be a great, pleasant meal. It wasn't to be a great pleasant meal. Because the sacrifice of Christ Jesus wasn't pleasant for him. It says he suffered greater than any person ever suffered. Why could he do that? Because they couldn't take his life. He had to lay it down. So he could suffer beyond any suffering that you can even begin to comprehend. And he did it to pay the price for our sin, just as simple as that. They were to roast it whole. It says, and you shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains until morning you shall burn with fire. By the time it was done, the evidence that it had even taken place was all gone. 
When I thought about this, I thought, I bet a lot of them didn't eat near as much as they thought they would eat. They didn't eat to be satisfied. They ate enough. You see, normally at twilight, the work was done for the day. You'd come in, get out of your work clothes, wash up a little bit. The wife would have made supper. You would have just lounged and enjoyed that meal till you were satisfied and went to sleep. But this meal wasn't supposed to be like that. This was supposed to be a meal of preparation of what you were about to do and accomplish. This was a meal that was very specific in its fashion. And so they wouldn't have eaten a whole lot. When I was a kid, we still have family reunions. But when I was a kid, my mom used to always be upset because we'd get home and I'd be hungry. She said, it was all that food. But even as a kid, I knew if you wanted to enjoy playing this and this and this and this, you didn't stop yourself. You ate, but you didn't stop yourself because if you did, then if everybody was going to be jumping off of the rock into the creek, you were going to say, oh, I don't feel much like jumping. So you ate. You ate enough. Not until you were satisfied, just enough so you could be ready to go. And this is why you look for enough so that you're ready to go. It says, you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, your staff on your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. They were to eat it fast. They were to eat it fast. When I was working construction, I will always remember this. The guys, when we had an opportunity, would like to go to a diner or to a restaurant to eat. Of course, if you go to a, a place like that, it's not like you can have a 30-minute lunch, you know? You get in there, you order, it takes a while. Bill knows that, right, Bill? And uh, they would like to do that because it gave them time to converse around the table and to talk about different things like that and everything. And uh, then what they ordered would always be interesting because they wouldn't order a whole lot because we're going back to work. We should have pour concrete or just something like that. And so you didn't want to be overstepped because you were going to have to be doing a lot of moving. And it used to seem like it would take forever to get these simple sandwiches to be delivered to your place so you could eat them. And inevitably, they would want to go to this place and we'd go to this place when we worked close enough to it and we'd order and we never got to eat in the place because by the time they came out of service, it was time to get going and so you grab it, you walk down the street if we were close enough to walk, otherwise you hopped into the company truck and you ate it on the way back. You ate it in a hurry. I always thought to myself, what a waste. You didn't get to enjoy it. This wasn't about enjoying the meal. We don't enjoy the fact that our Savior suffered. But it impacts us with a brand new relationship. There's a reason that all the evidence had to be gone. All the evidence of Jesus dying is gone. Because he rose again. Because he rose again. There's a reason all the evidence is gone. It's gone because he rose again. He fulfilled the penalty of God. He fulfilled the judgment of fire that's coming to all earth someday. He had completed it in its entirety. It was done. It was over. This new relationship of worship is about an emotional relationship in worship. myself out a nice little lane, a male lane, and the kid in the store says, it's a teddy bear. If you look at those feet, those are hooves. It's a lane, just as simple as that. <coughs> when you picked out that lamb, you had to bring it right into the house. Angie, if you had brought a lamb into your house with your kids, what would have been the first thing that your kids all did? <laughs> Right. Oh, can we play with it? Can we pet it? Can we feed it? Yeah. Exactly.
Exactly. And they would have grown. If he had girls, they'd have been putting ribbons in his hair and on his ears, and dressing him in dresses. How he knows that? Do you think those kids were any different? Not a bit. And so, in that short period of time, everybody would have gotten incredibly attached to that lamb. They would have gotten close. They would have petted. I know you like animals, Bill. You really like that, right? I don't know. It's not a big enough. Bill has pet pigs. Bill has pet pigs. When he first told me about pet pigs, I said, Bill, I says, they taste really good. He says, they're never going to be eaten. <laughs> then he got goats. His daughter got goats. I says, they taste real good, too. He says, they're never going to be eaten. Anyhow, he has some cool stuff up there. You visit Bill, you get a good tour of some families. It would have gotten close. Every kid in the house, even yourself, you know, had to get down on it. You got it. You would cuddle with it. You know, I've been around the lambs just a few times. One of the things that I know is you bring a lamb in out of the rest of them, and it cries. And you have to kind of curl up with it to get it quiet. Oh, yeah. And then, on the 14th day, Dad's going to take that lamb. He's going to kill it. They have kids that say, Hey, Daddy, why? For our sins. Because it's going to be the covering for us so we don't have to suffer the wrath of God. Because the wrath of God is coming this night. And that thing is just going to go through the land. But we won't have to worry about that. <coughs> because this land is going to take the way that penalty from us. And that's what Jesus does for us. He takes away that penalty. I can see it now. I'll never be bad again, Daddy. <laughs> well, I want you to know that's the emotional relationship that we should be giving our Savior for what he has done. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The difficulty is when we others have let Jesus into our house to get close to him. So I like how the Apostle John writes it. He says, who we have seen, who our hands have handled, who we have touched. John leaned against his chest and didn't think anything of it. Sometimes we haven't had the nearness that we should have had with our Savior. So his sacrifice doesn't affect us so much. But it was meant to be an emotional encounter with salvation. People lots of times say, why do you have to be so emotional? Because you got to call for it. God made us emotional beings so we knew how to love, so we knew how to hurt, so we knew how to have compassion, so we knew how to have mercy. And he wants that emotion in our worship. Communion ushers, we need come.
This morning I'm hoping that you're realizing, not because of me, but because the Spirit's revealing it to you, that even that very first Passover was a sign of what Jesus, God the Son, was going to do for each and every one of us. He was going to touch us with something that we couldn't of ourselves even begin to think of or comprehend. And one of the signs of the Messiah's coming was that he would bind up the broken heart. You think that religion's not about being emotional? Think again. Because if you're broken hearted, it's an emotional situation. But because God knows about emotions, and because God wants to be worshipped with emotions, God also heals those emotions, hallelujah, because he binds up the broken heart. We say, thank you, Lord. Because he's opened that veil so we can get right into the presence of the Most High God and receive the healing of a mighty God. Heavenly Father, as we hold the emblems of the body and blood of our Savior, we thank you for them, Lord. And Father, as Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he said to his disciples, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you. Lord, he suffered greatly, but because of the glory that he knew would come, he didn't mind suffering all that anguish. Help us, Lord, in the midst of our suffering to know that there's a God who indeed is going to give us great rewards beyond our comprehension. And we praise you for it. Let us do it together. the same man also he took the cup and after his supper he gave it to his disciples and he said drink ye all of it for this is the new covenant of my blood which is shed for many for the remission of sin we thank you God God we know that there's coming a day of judgment but we know we don't have to fear we know that there's coming a day of the wrath of God when all of the elements, as we have known them, will melt away with fervent heat and with fire. But we don't have to fear, Lord God. We don't have to fear because your blood has been resting upon us and we are cleansed by that blood to stand in the wholeness and the righteousness of our Savior before our God. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord, to show forth the praises of him 
who has called us out of the darkness of sin into his own glorious light. Help our sins to drop away. Help our light for you to be increased. In Jesus' name, let us drink together. That prayer that I said happens when you desire to return again and again and again to the holies of holies. As they collect the cups, worship the Lord with that song. <coughs>
Lord. You are marvelous. You are righteous. You are a You are a You are our You are a friend. You are here to lift us up. You are a Blessed be the name of the Lord Almighty. Hallelujah. So you just assemble right up here in this section. It's just going to be a very brief meeting right after we're done. And so I just give you those reminders. Bow your heads with me. Almighty God, God, you are our hope. You are our strength. It is in you, Lord, that we indeed even have our lives. Help us, Lord, to never take them for granted. And help us, Lord, not to live them for ourselves as spoiled children. But, Lord, to say, help me, Lord, to love you, to follow you, and to encounter you all the days of my life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.